Hey, welcome to Hourglass Cinema, a variety show from victims and villains, a nonprofit that educates and engages individuals on mental health awareness and suicide prevention through pop culture. My name is Captain Nostalgia. I am one of the writers and podcasters here. And on this episode, we're going to be opening up the cinema to some coverage that we did back in August from Creature Feature Weekend. If you guys have never heard of Creature Feature Weekend, it is a horror convention film festival hybrid it's a one of a kind experience it's honestly one of my favorite conventions to cover when we do do it It is in gettysburg pennsylvania you guys can find more information on their website at creaturefeatureweekend.com on this episode you can hear one of the co-hosts from horror movie nights talk about the film kind of their long process of deciding films, how they got started, and you guys can also catch them as a part of our Horrific Hope 48-hour fundraising stream event going on October 22nd through the 24th. They are specifically going to be streaming from 4 to 5 p.m. on October 22nd. It's twitch.tv forward slash victims and villains. All proceeds are going to get mental health resources into events like Creature Feature, film festivals, churches, and we're hoping within the next year to start getting them into after-school programs as well. Once again, that event is Horrific Hope, and it'll be October 22nd through the 24th. Starts at 2 p.m. with victims and villains kicking it off, and Horror Movie Night is right up after us. And like I said, we'll be going all weekend until October 24th at 2 p.m. And also on this episode, we're going to be talking to uh, the CEO behind Eek Coffee. And we also sat down with Shoshana Rosenbaum, a filmmaker that we met at Genre Blast this interview did take place at Genre Blast 2021 at the Alamo Draft House in Winchester, Virginia. Another great film festival that if you guys ever get a chance to please check it out. Shoshana's film is called Night Waking and you guys can also catch it as a part of our upcoming stream where we're going to be showcasing horrors. She's going to be in our 6 to 8 uh, horror shorts block on October 23rd. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and be sure you guys ch- hit that subscribe button. This Saturday we're going to be talking about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2003 as we continue our coverage of Abyss Gazing and go check out all of our other episodes episodes that we have released this year and in years past and i just hope you guys have a great day and remember that you have value and that you have worth if you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide addiction self-harm or depression we encourage you guys to please reach out this is the heartbeat of why we do what we do suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the united states and as of this recording there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on american soil and when you scale back internationally there are 800,000 successful suicides that is one death roughly every 40 seconds so if you or someone you know is struggling you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope that resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this there you'll find resources that include the national suicide lifeline which is 1-800-273-8255 you can also text help to 741-741 we also have a plethora of other resources including churches getting connected with counselors lgbt resources like the trevor project and also veteran hotline as well please if you hear nothing else in the show understand that you yes you listen to this right now have value and worth we get it suicide depression mental health these are hard topics and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier but please consider the resources right in the descriptions below wherever you guys are listening because once again you have value and you have worth so please stay with us Let's, let's give some fellow podcast love to Matthew Kelly, the host of, one of the hosts of Horror Movie Night. What's up, man? Hey, how you doing, buddy? I'm great, man. So, uh, I love horror. You love horror. 
our listeners, lots of our listeners love horror, so tell us a little bit about the show. So, Horror Movie Night actually had its origins uh, almost 10 years ago now, which is insane, um, on Reddit. Uh, we had, uh, there was Reddit R Horror. Someone had made a post saying we should start a movie club, and I jumped on that and created uh, Reddit Horror Club. And we ran a podcast through there where different people on Reddit would pick a movie, everyone would watch it, and then we would do a podcast episode discussing it. And that's how I met Scott and our first host, uh, co-host Adam. And what we kind of found was like people wanted to pick good movies, which we had no fun talking about. But when one of us would pick like a really stupid movie, like we'd pick like Puppet Master 3, <laughs> we'd have an absolute blast talking about it. So we were like, all right, well, we don't want to like force these people to have to pick bad movies. So we like passed the show off to someone else. And then we, all the three of us, went and started Horror Movie Night. And Adam eventually left the show and we brought in my brother Brian about three years ago and we've been doing it for seven years now so much so that like it's gotten to the point that horror is not like my casual viewing anymore because I feel like after you've watched at least one horror movie and had to discuss it every single week for seven years it's like when it's some when you have downtime you're like you know what I'll pop on like a teen flick from the 90s or something like it's like I need something light I've watched so many movies at this point you know we're 300 plus episodes in and then that's not including like watching in theaters now stuff and and all of that so it's it's nice I still really love horror I still love doing the show but man sometimes you get burned out on it (laughs) Yo, true facts have never been spoken. Yeah. Uh, man, like, uh, I also, we, we just launched our, our own, like, spinoff horror yeah. podcast. And uh, me and another writer have done only a couple episodes so far. But it's, like, we got to a point right, right now between, like, the pandemic and, like, reviewing, like, everything with Shudder and, and Arrow and stuff like that. Like, I'm just, like... You just need a break every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> like, you just get overwhelmed by it. Like, it's just... And it's the the worst part is that it's all good. There's so much good content out there. So it's like it's not even like you can be like, oh man, heart. Like there was a point in the late '90s when I stopped watching horror because I just felt like everything was so bad that was coming out. I was like, I'm just gonna stick with the stuff that I loved and not bother with the new stuff. And then, I mean, the last like ten years, it's been like some of the best stuff that's ever come out. But it's also some of the longest stuff that's ever come out. Like I was just talking to someone else earlier today at the convention. You know, I, I really, in my core, I don't think a horror movie ever needs to go beyond 90 minutes. But, like, you know, it's cool that we're getting these, like, legitimate art form horror movies now. Like, I love that. But, like, when I'm just hanging out in my house, like, I don't really want to put on, like, Midsummer or Hereditary. I want to pop in, like, Alligator or Sleepaway Camp. You know what I mean? Like, I want to watch, I want to watch, like, something that's 80 minutes. It's ridiculous. You can shut your brain off. And it's, like, a good, like, I don't know. I just... I've been in so much existential terror for the last two years. Like, I need the I need the popcorn horror movies yeah, 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 real yeah. bad right now. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's crazy, like too, like because you you go to like to go back to like you know like Puppet Master three, yeah. like kind of like campier like side of horror. It's it's crazy how much more conversation I feel like you can pull from something like one of those kinds of movies for than sure. you can like deconstructing like an art house film. Yeah, I mean they're also just infinitely rewatchable. Yeah, you know I mean like. The rewatch value of the first three Puppet Master movies is insane to me. Like, honestly, the that, like, I would say maybe Charles Band's entire career circa, like, 1988 to 1994 is just, like, they're not good movies, but, man, can you rewatch them a lot. <laughs> like, like, Dolls, have you ever watched Dolls? I haven't. It's on, currently on my shutter list right yeah. now. Dolls is... Amazing, like it's legitimately amazing. Like they made, if if I'm, I might get these mixed up, but I'm pretty sure Dolls was literally made during the downtime of From Beyond. Like it's shot on the same sets, it uses a lot of the same cast, and it was like, oh, we're waiting for the special effects to get done with From Beyond. Let's shoot another movie while we're here, and they shot this like crazy movie about a kid and his parents who go to a mansion and it's inhabited by a bunch of killer dolls. Um, But the stop motion in it is, like, unbelievable. And this is, you know, a good, like, two or three years before Puppet Master. So I'm pretty sure this is, like, what is the true original Puppet Master movie in a lot of ways. 
Yeah, there's some real gems out there in, in the 80s. Like, all right, so, like, I guess, like, my next question doesn't have to do with the show, but, like, yeah. as a horror fan, like, especially, like, of the 80s era, like, what is, like, one hidden gem that you feel like everyone should check out? I mean, I mentioned it earlier. Alligator, if you haven't watched it, is the most fun Jaws pair, like, Jaws ripoff film ever made. But I would say, actually, I can tie it back to the show. On the show, my brother had us watch a movie that was on Amazon Prime called Out of the Dark that he found it because he was on a John Waters kick and he was trying to watch every movie that Divine had ever been in. And he was like, what is Out of the Dark? And the cover was just like a creepy clown mask. Um, So he watched it and was like, dude, we're talking about this movie. And it's basically like a... It's sort of a slasher film, but it also has like a little bit of like a true crime investigative journalist hint to it, where it's like this guy wearing a clown mask going around killing people, um, and like the the detective trying to solve the case. But like, there's also a whole subplot about like a phone sex hotline, and that he's only killing girls that are on the phone sex hotline, and it's this crazy murder mystery. But it is actually so much fun. Like the kills are interesting, but like it's just campy enough that like it never takes itself too seriously and I think that was like 1988 or 89 it was one of Divine's last movies so it's definitely worth checking out um, and it's Divine not in drag which is like a rare thing to see so let me just say that I can confirm that like yeah. I have been suggesting that movie for years yeah I randomly so yeah I it's... randomly came across it on Amazon I was just like alright I'm bored what is this and then like by the end I'm just like Dear God, this is so good. You are, I must tell you, so good at the stone face doing this. Because I'm like, <laughs> I'm like looking into your eyes and I'm like, he doesn't even know what I'm talking about. And then you're just like, it's one of my favorite. We're like, beautifully done. <laughs> beautifully done. I, I love that. Uh, no, but yeah, no. I mean, there's there's so many good ones. I, I wouldn't say this is a deep cut, but like one of our first episodes, and it was the first episode to do really, really well. It was kind of the episode that put us on the map a little bit was Dr. Giggles. We did as our fourth episode. And I don't necessarily recommend checking out the first like hundred episodes of our podcast because, you know, we were young, dumb, and didn't know what we were doing. Sure. But, um, I mean, I think Dr. Giggles is... It came out at a time when horror was really bad and no one wanted to watch slasher films anymore, but I think it is one of the most fun slasher films that has ever been made. Like, it's just a dude killing people using the strangest doctor tools you've ever seen in your entire life. There's a scene where he, like, liposuctions a person to death. Like, it is wild the way he kills people in this movie. So, Dr. Giggles, if you can track down the copy, or I'm sure it's streaming somewhere, but that movie is an absolute fucking blast. Oh, can I curse on this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, it's an absolute blast from front <laughs> to back. That's awesome. So, tell us a little bit about kind of, like, how you guys, because so I see that, like, you guys have t-shirts here and Thanks for sale. Did you guys kind of like get into this as like kind of like a fun hobby? So we were doing the podcast and we had hit a hundred episodes and we were like, all right, we've got a hundred episodes. We launched a Patreon and we were like, let's start doing conventions. But like the first convention we did was Monster Mania, which is both a really great show and a really bad show. Um, depending on on your status, essentially. Like for kind of a nobody table. Like, you're going to get put in a room that you might not get as much foot traffic. And it's just really hard to get people's attention at at Monster Mania. Because they have, arguably, they probably have the biggest name guests out of any horror convention. You know, they're bringing in, like, the cast of The Walking Dead or the cast of Stranger Things. So there's people that are waiting in line for five, six hours to meet people. So they're not coming into the showroom as much. So we were like, we need to justify having a table. Like, if we're going to pay X amount of dollars to have a table, it just to hand out business cards isn't good enough so it started with us literally just making two t-shirts we had the t-shirt with our logo which was like the screaming vhs tape and we made um a t-shirt that was literally my my roommate at the time was doing t-shirts for t public and they had de- they had declined this design and i thought it was brilliant which was i cthulhu hp so it was literally like the i heart new york but it was a cthulhu monster instead of a heart so we just got those printed up by a friend and you know maybe sold like five of them you know like it wasn't like a super profitable weekend but the next day we saw like the the following week we saw our numbers definitely went up so like the the operation of like be noticeable hand out business cards worked 
So then it kind of turned into like, let's make sure that we always have new shirts every single year. Um, so like you're literally looking at seven years worth of adding t-shirts to our roster. Um, and then also like, let's make the table something that you can't ignore. So like loud music, an old Super Nintendo on the table. Uh, for a long time, we had a giant cow head that people could wear that we would bring That's to awesome. the cons. Um, we would have like props that people could take pictures in. So Scott would bring like a Freddy glove that you could put on and get a picture with. And he had a Leslie Vernon mask that you could wear and take a picture with. Um, so it was literally at that point, it was just like draw people in. And that kind of also, A, it did what I hoped it would do, which was that it allowed us to meet more people. It allowed us to, like, build up our show's credibility. But also it helped sell shirts in a weird way because, like, you maybe get two minutes to talk to a person when they pop by your table. But if they see a video game and they pick up a controller and they start playing, now you've got, like, 15, 20 minutes yeah. to really try to win them over. Um, and while they're standing there, they're looking at your merch, they're talking to you, they're hearing about your show, they're hearing about the stuff that you do. So it became really useful, and now I kind of use this for all of the shows. I, I uh, Beyond Horror Movie Night, I, I am the head of content for the network that we're on, which is the Geekscape Network. So when we do like San Diego and New York Comic Con, we try to bring that same energy of like, let's set up a TV, let's have video games, like let's make sure that we're a table that you can't just like passively walk by, sure. that you're being drawn in. Um, but it's it's tough out there. It's tough to it's tough to market. I feel bad for non horror podcasts, honestly, because like, you know, I do a podcast about Christmas, and I do a podcast about one hit wonders, and I do a po- just like a general like life podcast. And like, there aren't a whole lot of one hit wonder cons. There's not a whole lot of Christmas cons. You know what I mean? But like, there's plenty of horror cons. Like, if you got a horror podcast, you got all. If you're willing to travel, you could fill your whole summer every weekend with going out and promoting your show but it's a lot of work it's i mean i just recently quit my job to do podcasting full time and you know the advice my dad gave me was very very true which is like if you're working for yourself it's either going to be the best paying hardest job of your entire life or the lowest paying easy job of your entire life and it all depends on you on that yeah (laughs) yeah 100 you guys are obviously here uh we're leaving covid times obviously michael myers hannibal lecter uh, Leatherface, wear a mask, but I got to ask because our second episode that we ever did for uh, our horror podcast was 1973 Wicker Man. Okay. And I see here the love for the underrated Nicolas Cage. Wicker the Nicolas Cage. So, so the Nicolas Cage one was the first episode of our Patreon. Uh, we <laughs> we uh, one of the bonus things on our Patreon was that once a month each one of us would pick a movie and it could be any movie it didn't have to be a horror movie it could be anything and the patreon subscribers would vote on what movie we would do a bonus episode on and wicker man was the first one it won like by i think like 96 percent of the vote or something like that um but that actually literally came from i am of all the i'm a ska fan i love pop punk i love hip-hop all of that but my absolute favorite genre of music is just like 90s grunge like I'll drive around just listening to old 90s rock all the time so I was listening to Smashing Pumpkins and Bullet with a Butterfly Wings came on and I had the idea despite all my rage I'm still just Nick in a cage and I was like that is so fucking funny (laughs) so like I was like what can we do with that and I thought about it and then I was like of course him in the wicker man with the basket over his head it's perfect so we hit up uh, one of our friends is is Cody from Studio House Designs which is like the best horror shirt design company in the world if you've never checked them out they uh, do the famous like VHS stack t-shirts um, but we hit him up and we gave him hey this is the idea and he was like give me a week and <laughs> he sent us that design and that shirt has been selling like hot cakes ever since that that kept us alive during the pandemic you you pointed out the covid wear a mask shirts ironically the shirts on our table are the last versions of these because we got cease and desists for every single one of the designs uh but it was fun while it lasted we you know and it's putting out a good message we try really hard with with horror movie night to be um as much as we like to joke around and talk about horror we're also very big on mental health that's like a big thing for us uh my brother is seven years sober um, from Oxycontin and, and cocaine addiction and Scott just you know he struggles with depression he struggles with anxiety I've been seeing a therapist for like seven years now because I struggle so much with like anxiety and self-doubt and especially you know 
quitting your job to do stuff like this, you, you get imposter syndrome real quick, you know? So we try to really be honest and sincere. As much as we are, you know, the dick and fart joke podcast of horror, like, we do like to also have that element of sincerity of talking about these issues and talking about what's going on in the world and, like, not being afraid to, like, you know, if we're going to talk about Tales from the Hood, we're going to talk about Tales from the Hood. We're not going to sit there and make jokes about it. We're going to talk about, like, you know, this movie's more relevant in 2021 than it was in 1995. And, like, that's not good. That shouldn't be the case. So, like, it's... I, I think that... I don't think it's everybody... It's not everybody's job. And we try really hard to find that happy balance. And I think sometimes we lean too hard into talking about the real stuff. And then sometimes we don't lean hard enough. But, like, we're every day we're working to find that perfect balance. Because it's like you can't... After the last two years of everything, you can't just, like put the blinders on and pretend that there's not things that you know when you have an audience of our size which isn't you know it's big it's not amazing but it's bigger than I ever imagined I would have of a listening audience the fact that I go to shows and there's people who I've never met my entire life who know me and want to talk to me about my podcast like I can't with good conscience not try to put a positive message out there whether it's you know get a get a vaccine or even more simplistically just like tell your friends that you love them and like make sure that you're like taking care of your mental health and like life's too short to do things that you absolutely hate like I think those are really important messages and I mean the big one I always try to live uh, put out there with everything is like love yourself and love the people around you and like we can make the world a better place if we actually put in an effort yeah I mean that was actually going to be my, my la- <laughs> one of my last questions was going to be like you know we always try to end on that mental health note yeah and you guys we've talked about it a little, little bit yeah, on, online yeah online and um, so I, I, my last question is like why is it so important for us to be having conversations about mental health Oh, I mean, I put off seeing a therapist for so long because it was so stigmatized. I was like, oh, if I see a therapist, that means something's wrong with me, and I, I don't want there to be something wrong with me. So it's almost like that ostrich syndrome, right? Like, yeah. what you can't see isn't there. But, like, you know, seeing a therapist, it wasn't what the pop culture had made you think it was. And I think that that's important. I think that what I've learned in, in life, and I've learned over the last couple of years, but, like, those conversations are important. You know what I mean? Like, I think that there's a lot of people in the world that want to stigmatize difficult conversations as very different than what they are, right? Like, like they, people act like you can't talk about injustices as a white male without you becoming a self-hating white male. And it's like, that's not the case. Like, sure, yeah. you can absolutely be like, look, I've... You know, the example I always use is I tell this story all the time where I got pulled over maybe five years ago for speeding. I didn't have my license with me. I didn't have my registration. I didn't have an insurance card and my car hadn't been inspected. It was past inspection. And I got let off with a warning. Like, I promise you if I wasn't a white dude, that wouldn't have been the way that that played out. You know what I mean? So it's like being aware of those situations and saying, okay, that's not okay. And, like, just telling that story is progress to me. It's better than ignoring that story. And I think that that goes hand in hand with mental health. Like, putting it out there and saying it's okay. It's okay to feel sad. It's okay to feel frustrated. It's okay to be depressed. Like, those are huge emotions. And I know that, like, from my own stance, when you see someone else going through a thing and you go, oh, my God, I've been there. I felt that way before. That's so, it's so welcoming. It's a warm hug. It's an audio hug in a weird way. It's very comforting to know that you're not alone in the emotions that you're feeling. So, like, again, we might be a dick and fart joke podcast, but if we're, like, also giving people that warm hug with what we're talking about and saying, no, like, I've tried to kill myself, like, or with my brother, like, he's almost overdosed three different times, like... Those stories, those stories of victory, those stories of overcoming those faults, that saves lives, man. Yeah. Like, that saves so many more lives than you realize. I can't tell you the amount of emails we get from people letting us know that our podcast helped them through a divorce or helped them through the death of their kid or, like, all of these heavy, heavy things. But, like, giving that little bit of joy and that little bit of comfort, like, there's a lot of reality to that meme. I I love this meme of... 
the person sitting next to the billboard of people eating yogurt and he's eating yogurt with them and it says this is what it's like to listen to a podcast <laughs> like there's a lot of truth to that like there is this feeling of community with people that you've never met before that's why I love doing the cons I love meeting listeners and they'll hang out at the table for like two hours and I'll just I just love hearing their stories how did they find us like what's the favorite thing about their show like but not even just that like how are they doing how's like what, what are you doing for work do you have a passion that you're working towards? Like that stuff's really important to me. Like I love knowing that like someone's like, yeah, you know, like I'm working at this job, it's whatever, but like I really love doing art, so I've been working on a children's book. That's fucking amazing. Yeah, like, yeah. It's like that's amazing. Please keep doing that. Like that's the stuff that I think is so cool. And I think that that's you know, I my whole life I wanted to be a filmmaker. That's what I always wanted to do. Moved to LA, lasted six months. I was like, this sucks. Came home, <laughs> came home completely dejected and defeated. And then I got into podcasting, and like, I'll, I'll leave with this story. I think that I was thinking about this on my drive here. So I went through probably one of the worst breakups of my entire life in 2008, right? Um, so at that time, I was listening to a lot of like angry, pissed off punk music because that's, you know, my thing. So I was listening to Five Iron Frenzy, which was my favorite band of all time. I was listening to this band Punchline, and I was listening to Less Than Jake. Those were like the three big ones in my car. And in that time period, I was like really falling in love with these bands. I was falling in love with these records. And you get this mindset of like, I'd love to meet those guys, but I'll never get to unless I'm in a band. And that was my mindset. I'm not talented enough to be in a band, so I'm never going to meet these guys. Well, then, (laughs) now here we are in 2021, I'm... I started a podcast with one of the members of Five Iron Frenzy. I run a podcast company with the basis from Punchline, and one of our clients is the lead singer of Less Than Jake. Like, full circle. Full circle. All of these people that when I was 21 was thinking, I'll never get to be, I'll never even get to meet these people because I'm not in a band. Through the power of podcasting, they're like legitimate friends whose numbers are in my phone. You know what I mean? It's like, it's unreal it's unreal how many doors it unlocked and i can't i'm not going to sit here and promise that to every person who's a podcaster but but i i uh, i'm a huge fan of ted lasso on on apple plus and he recently did a whole episode uh, there was a whole speech in the recent episode about rom communism is what he called it the the belief that just like in any rom-com no matter how bad things are the world finds a way of making it work out for you i think that that's legit <laughs> i think it's very real I think that if you put enough things into the, if you put enough good vibes into the universe and you really work hard at it, it's not that secret bullshit where it's like you just think about it and it'll come to you. You have to put in the work, but like, I am living the best life, I'm living a better life than I could have ever imagined as a filmmaker doing podcasting. It's, it's been the, the greatest blessing of my life. And to be able to take that and use that as a way to, to spread a positive message about mental health on top of all of that, I mean, I'll, I'll be a happy man until my dying day. You know, I could die tomorrow and I would have zero regrets about anything. So. All right, so my last question, and this is the question that everyone loves, is where can people find you online? So, Horror Movie Night, it's hmnpodcast.com. That's where the main show is. The Geekscape Network is geekscape.net. I do want to throw a big, quick please to all of your listeners. I am currently working on the Geekscape YouTube channel, uh, Geekscape TV. I am having a blast making some of the videos that are up there. Uh, if you're into anything even remotely geeky, we've got videos on like why I did a video called Why We Love the Frighteners, all about like how amazing that movie is. But we've also got like the top 10 best album, debut albums of the 90s. And we've got videos on Adult Swim. And we're working on a video about the history of ALF. So like anything that's geeky, weird, pop culture go check it out. I'm putting a lot of work into that stuff and I love it. Uh, and then lastly, if you want to start a podcast of your own or you just want to chat about podcasting and figure out how you could do your own, we know podcasting.com is uh, the consultation and editing company that I run. So hit us up. We'll find a good rate for you. And the advice is always free. I'm never going to charge anybody for advice. So, Well, thank you, sir. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. Thanks for, for reaching out. Yeah. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events. Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. 
You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations. Educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains, or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. What's going on? I'm sitting here with Krista from Eek Coffee. What's going on? Hey, hey, how's it going? Did I put too much emphasis on the Eek? No, I kind of <laughs> loved it. <laughs> All right, I, so I'll, I'll like I'll, I'll edit it and I'll isolate it, and you guys can just run it for like promo, Instagram videos, whatever you guys want. Love it. That'd be great. <laughs> All right, so tell me how you got started in the coffee business. So my family is obsessed with coffee. They, I wouldn't quite say good coffee, but we always have like a small coffee just, like in our house. And so you know when you have family over or friends over, like you make a pot of coffee, and it just that's what that kind of like signifies to me. Um, so. Fast forward, I went to school for special effects makeup, and I had a love of anything weird and monsters. And so I just kind of like, one day I had this little daydream, I was like, you know what, maybe when I retire, I'll do a coffee shop. Well, if I'm going to be different than everyone else, i got to make it weird. So I was like, okay, well, I'll combine my love of monsters and coffee, and here's Eek. It's awesome. And it feels like there's been this, like, uprising and like horror themed coffee <laughs> it seems like there is i started this a year ago and since then it's good i'm just I, I get the same thing as you i see it like in my instagram i'm like oh that's a fun one yeah. that's a new one <laughs> I'm, I'm all about it so uh so let's kind of walk through some of the some of the products and some of the before we get into that like tell us about the process of kind of like finding like the beans a lot of trial and error. So I did a ton of research on like what kind of flavors I wanted. I really didn't even know where I wanted to start. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to start with a medium blend. That's going to be something that everyone loves. And so I just researched and researched and researched. I was like, okay, where is this grown? What, how is it grown? What kind of temperatures? What flavor does it produce? And so I kind of just experimented in my kitchen over and over and over and spent way too much money on all the different beans and Two years later, trial and error, I uh, have a product. <laughs> I'm super excited to, to try this product. I just want to throw that out there. Much like uh, if you guys heard our Sleepaway Camp episode, I hadn't tried any of Camp Crystal Latte yet, um, but I am super excited <laughs> to try it um, because I love coffee and I love horror, so the two worlds together. And you have like a very uh, kind of almost like old school like horror feel to like the art can you kind of talk about like the process of like designing like the signature uh, looks for each of the bags and labels sure so designing the bags the first one was this, uh, Frankie, which is kind of like take on Frankenstein um, and it was kind of by accident I was just sketching the one day and this was still when this was like you know just a little daydream like a fun project and I just went Oh, that's it. And so I took this sketch and it was, you know, very like retro vintage feel. And I sent it to my artist friend and I said, Hey, just for fun, can you do something with this? And he sent me this amazing logo and I just went, Okay, I have to do something with it. <laughs> I was like, I can't let this go to waste. Yeah. And so it kind of like jolted the process and so I, I kinda like to stick with the universal monsters with a little flare. Um, so, like, my wolf man is not really like the wolf man, like, he's uh, actually a New Orleans like, werewolf creature. Or, like, my, my zombie, she's a zombie ballerina because it's based on a true story, and I kind of just like to really incorporate different, different things with my characters rather than just being like, oh, here's a vampire, or here's Frankenstein, or, you know, whatever the character may be. There's always a story and fun packaging with it. All right, now you got me curious. I want to hear this, this story behind the zombie ballerina. <laughs> So I was a dancer growing up and I 
fast forward, I was listening to a podcast that I really like, and they were doing a story on this theater fire in Philadelphia, and it was graphic and horrible and really haunting, and so it was just this fire that, or uh, this theater that like caught on fire, and these ballerinas got trapped inside, and so naturally being a dancer, I was like, oh my god, this is something that I like resonate with, and so... I immediately knew I was like, that's my next, that's my next bud. I have to do that. Um, so that one is a decaf because you feel like a zombie without caffeine. Yeah. <laughs> that's so, so cheesy. <laughs> but um, what's different about this one is oh, the packaging. So if you look at each packaging, it comes with uh, Matchbox artwork, like vintage Matchbox, and then a little ballerina, like two 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 go. And then on the back, because it was a theater fire, there's an admission ticket, and then it tells you a little bit about the story and a QR code to the podcast, so while you make your coffee, you can listen to the story. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> if you're going to sell decaf, you got to make it good. <laughs> yes, uh, I am a strong component defender of death before decaf, <laughs> so uh, I think you might have just sold me on, on decaf. <laughs> <laughs> At least, you know, you're bringing some theatricality to it. I mean, if you're going to sell something that no one wants, you got to make it fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> so can you kind of walk us through some of the, like, the blends and, like, the tastes and, and stuff like that for, like, listeners that might be interested in, in trying the coffee? Sure. So our main blend is the Frankie blend. That's just, like, a regular house medium blend. It's got low acidity, if that's something that, you know, stuff your mom if your stomach bothers you when you drink coffee, that's a lot of complaints that I get about coffee. Um, very just like full flavor. Um, and then we've got our vanilla blend, which is the Awakening. It's our vampire. Um, that's going to be like a, a darker roast with a hint of vanilla. It's not overpowering. And then we have our zombie decaf, which I just told you about. Also a very mellow flavor. And then this is actually our newest one. It is Southern Pecan, and like I was telling you before, the creature is a New Orleans werewolf because we're actually relocating to New Orleans in December. Well, awesome. I was glad I'm able to, like, get this <laughs> now. So, like, my next question is, of course, obviously, is, like, is the, is the plug? Where can people find you? Where can people buy the coffee? So we don't have a physical location. Um, we just do all online and events. So you can go to eatcreaturecafe.com, and it's four E's. <laughs> Instagram, um, we do not have a Facebook, but website, Instagram, conventions, we're all over. <laughs> um, so we're, we'll have all those in, in the descriptions wherever you guys are listening to this podcast. But uh, the last thing that we always like to kind of when we do these conventions is we always kind of like to end on uh, the heartbeat of why we create this content. And so you kind of created this out of kind of the the pandemic and kind of a lot of like I feel like mental health during that time was kind of like just really low for a lot of people and so my, my question would be to like can you spread out some like encouragement for anyone that you know might be kind of in that position that just needs to hear that they need to like follow their dreams I mean absolutely I I started this because I really love hosting and just being like, here, let me make you a cup of coffee. And like, it's, it's comforting. It's something you would do for a friend or a family member. And during the pandemic, this, I started this last August. So this was like, not mid pandemic, but it was, it was around that time. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to take the leap. I'm going to do it because it's not something you have to go out and buy. You can order it, it's gonna to come to you, and you can sit there with your family or your friend or whoever you're you know, quarantined with and have a cup of coffee and have that aroma just around and have a good conversation. It really just like lifts your spirits. So that was my hope for you know launching this during that. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. Like, you know, coffee with coffee conversations with, with friends and community really does kind of help boost the spirits of one's mental health. And so I'm grateful to find uh, DIY businesses and small businesses like you. Um, and hopefully the listeners will be able to support you um, in your next venture. I wish you a lot. Best of luck moving to you said New Orleans. New Orleans. New Orleans. <laughs> All right. You guys have a good one. 
Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Masha. We're a couple and hosts of the podcast Love What I Love. We both love movies, but have very different tastes. I love horror movies, but Masha will be the first to tell you that she is having none of that. And I love a good rom-com, but could never convince Andy to watch any of my favorites. So we decided to finally give each other's favorite movies a shot. And share why we love them while diving into the process and the people that brought our favorite movies to life. So please join us every other Monday as we take turns trying to convince each other and you to love what we love. Love What I Love can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in to see if I can get Masha to love the Warriors. Or if I can get Andy to not roll his eyes at Legally Blonde. We can't wait for you to join us. And if you want to share what you love, come find us on social media at LWIL Podcast. See you there. I'm here in genre blast with uh, filmmaker Shoshana Rosenbaum talking about her short film, Night Waking. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. How are you? I'm well. So for the listeners that are currently listening to this, probably don't know what Night Waking is. Can you kind of walk us through, give us an elevator pitch for the film? Sure. I mean, it's the kind of film where you don't want to know too much going into it, but it's about um, a family, um, two moms and their two young kids, um, on a night when they have to face an existential threat. So I'm going to make a comparison just for our listeners to kind of understand, like, what to kind of semi expect. Uh, I, I felt like this film is like a condensed version of A Quiet Place. Mm. And uh, can you kind of talk about the challenges of creating an effective family dynamic? Yeah, well, thank you. That's a huge compliment because I love A Quiet Place. Um, yeah, I mean, as I said in the Q&A, one of the things that really helped in terms of creating the family dynamic was that the the central characters are actually a real mom and child uh, couple, so pair. Um, so they already had that, obviously, established relationship to build on. Um, and they did a lot of rehearsal on their own together. Um, and then the the other woman who plays the main character's wife, um, we also you know made sure that they got to know each other and kind of established a backstory together. Um, so, um, and then the baby was just easy to work with because it was <laughs> an infant. <laughs> but um, is that what you mean, kind of like with the actors, or do you mean um, the story? I mean, like story-wise, narrative-wise. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, I have to give credit to the source material. So this is actually based on a short story that my older brother wrote. He's a science fiction writer, Benjamin Rosenbaum. And it was published about, I think, about 10 years ago. It's always been one of my favorite stories of his because it basically takes like a science fiction scenario that's familiar and really zooms in on like what that would be like for one family to experience so it's very intense and because the situation which i'm not going to say but is something that you've probably you've seen in other science fiction stories um it i think it it makes it easy to relate to and kind of perhaps like imagine your own family in can you kind of talk about crafting the uh, i guess the, the casting process because one of the things that i feel like it's really hard to convey like deep emotional themes in short films and this film feels like a master class in that oh thank you it's it's very well done can you kind of talk about the casting process and how like hard and or easy it was to really find the right people to bring the story to life yeah i mean it, it definitely we it was obviously the, the family has to feel like a real family and the couple has to feel like a real marriage so we um we focus first on our central character because um, she really carries a lot of the emotional weight of the film. And once we had cast her, we called back some of the people we had already seen and then some new people to make sure that we could have our two main um, actresses who are playing each other's wives, have them really have a chemistry that, that felt real. And um, once we achieved that, and like I said, there was the pre-existing um, relationship of the, the child and the, the older child in the film is the real child of one of the moms. So. That, that really helped too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I give credit to the story that it's based on to the screenwriter, Liz Maestri, who adopted it into a, into a film script. And then, um, and then all of us just working together to really, you know, we filmed it in my house. So <laughs> I guess it had that energy of like a real family. And, um, and it was mostly a night shirt, uh, shoot as it takes place, you know, uh, over one, one evening. So I think all that, and we shot it in a weekend. So it was like, I think all that intensity contributes to it. Yeah, and so one of the things that I, I feel like your film conveys really well is the kind of the reality that marriage, the challenges that marriage can have, especially when you're facing a existential crisis like their characters are in this movie, where you have one that's kind of very like everything is going to be all right, and then you have that one that's always like 
no, it's not. Like, like the reality is this is what's at stake. And you guys can, you convey that really well. And, uh, but my next, I just wanted to compliment you on that. Thank you. My next question is, uh, this film is very red. Mm. Um, was that always kind of the intent of, uh, having the color palette be that way to convey the crisis? Yeah, that was an intentional choice. That's something that's not in the original story, but we thought a lot about um, visually, like how do we want to convey that there is a threat that's outside the house and that is growing. And so we chose that color because we felt like that was something that um, that was a simple and yet it's still ambiguous so that, you know, until kind of three quarters of the way through the film, you might still not quite know what the threat is. But um, but yeah, so that was... we. Red is, I think, kind of the, uh, one of those colors that we associate with like an emergency or something. So we thought that was would help us convey that. So my last question for you is dealing with, obviously, there's a lot of uh, high, strong intensity and anxiety that this film has had. And uh, can you kind of talk about how the like, intensity from like anxiety from parents, children notice it and kind of pick up on it. And one of the things that we really strive to do is we always try and talk about how environments can really have an impact on the growing conditions. And I feel like your film conveys that really well. You kind of talk about how important that was to the story. Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, I'm a mom, and so that's, I think I make genre films often to explore like some of my own anxieties, or especially around parenting, because like you're saying, that's so, um, I mean, whatever you're feeling, your kids are going to pick up on to some degree. Um, and I think that's one of the things I really liked about the story is that it explores and that we definitely built up in Liz, the writer built up in the screenplay, was that one of the parents really chooses like to um, just focus on the on the family and the love they have for each other and not and not on the anxiety. <laughs> and she kind of has to pull her partner along with her eventually to get to that place. Um, because because that's what what's best for the kids. I mean, the, and, and in fact, what's kind of interesting is like behind the scenes, the young boy in the film who was eight, he didn't he hadn't read the whole script, and his mom kind of told all of us before we shot, I don't really want him to know what this is about. <laughs> like, so he Fair. didn't actually know he was not, and she was like, I kind of want to keep him in the same place that the character his character is in, where his moms have not told him like what's happening, and so um, so we all talked about that with the crew. So nobody obviously it was kind of interesting, but it it wasn't that hard to do, and as you know, you may know like when you're behind the scenes of a horror movie it's not as scary as when you're watching the horror movie or that kind of thing so it was actually not as hard as I thought to keep that secret from him and just have what we did around him be you know playful and um yeah I thought that was an interesting choice I'm pretty sure the filmmakers of Pet Cemetery did the same thing oh really okay yeah that makes sense I think if you're working with kids then you know you, ha you might make different choices than you would with adult actors Actually, I misspoke. It's it's still uh, Miko Hughes, but it was the Wes Craven's new nightmare. Oh, okay. So, um, so but, but my uh, my last question is: you you mentioned that this is a short story, and obviously, uh, short films are a little bit harder to kind of see if they're not like mm -hmm. on the internet or something if they're doing festival runs. So, is there a place where people can uh, actually check out the book? Um, yeah, so it's not, I don't, I think this story has only been published online. Um, I believe I might be wrong here. I think it was published in Strange Horizons, but I'm not 100% sure. But it's on the web, the short story, if you want to read the source material, um, it's on BenjaminRosenbaum.com. That's my, my brother's website. Um, so, and I can, I can find out and tell you later, like, where specifically it is. But I'm pretty sure it's linked on his website if you want to see it. Cool. Well, we'll be sure to provide that for you guys listening right now in the descriptions below. Uh, Shoshana, thank you for your time, and my last question, I said this again, is uh, where can people find out more information about the, the film and where it's playing and or if it's, if it's online? Yeah, it's not, it's not online yet because it's still playing in festivals, but um, you can go to my website, which is Shoshana, S-H-O-S-H-A-N-A, -S Rosenbaum, R-O-S-E-N-B-A-U-M, dot com, um, and there's, you know, where it's playing in festivals, and eventually, once it's done with this festival run, I'll put a link to it um, up there. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you so much.